hopefully people are tuning in. My name is Albert, and we are going to meet our panel right away. Thank you for joining. If you're wondering why we're at Dunder Mifflin, it's because if you didn't fill out the survey, you didn't realize that you had a choice. And so I guess everybody wanted the boringest background, except Stan is back there. So he's holding the fort right now. Anyways, I'm Albert, and this is, I guess this is the new normal, me sitting in front of my computer, but I guess there are people out there listening, and this feels like maybe kind of like a radio show. So what we're going to do is just tee up the talk before we get into it and meet our panel. So just want to say thank you for everybody joining in and tuning in. We do have people all over the world and in North, throughout North America joining this talk. It seems like a pretty good topic and hot topic that people want to learn how to innovate, move faster within solving problems in their organization. But before that, let's just talk quickly about who we are. So for those of you guys who don't know who Zoo is, we are in Saskatoon and we are just a local design consultancy that focuses on digital solutions. We've been around for 25 years plus. Um, this is kind of us in the 90s, but today we are not super big, but we're about 35 people big. We're a team of strategists, designers, and developers um, running the gamut of all sorts of IT projects. Um, if you're ever in Canada, Saskatoon, or in Saskatchewan, feel free to stop by. This is our office and just a little look around how we work. Again, the new normal is here, but we used to work in our experience room where we do a lot of these workshops and a lot of this training, but I don't know if we'd be able to fit the 150 plus people that signed up. Anyways, just a quick look at what we do day to day. And this is, you know, what we try to produce is like big enterprise applications, websites, um, mobile experiences. And we've been doing this over decades and understanding what it takes to make really good user experiences. And this is what we're going to kind of talk about today is that it's not just about what's on the digital screen, but yet what is the product and service you're delivering and what are the experiences you want to want to give. So Today, we're going to be talking about innovation, customer experience, and the process that we use to kind of solve our problems. You know, at a certain point when you work in tech and design, I say you essentially become a problem solver because it seems that technology seems to be the answer to a lot of the problems that organizations have, or the first thing that people think about is how do we use technology to solve this? So for us, it was really important that we don't completely chase the next um, tech wave and that we had to root ourselves in some sort of framework and methodology that was going to help us as consultants to evolve our business, opposed to always chasing that next thing like AI, machine learning. It's, it's really important for us. And so this is a process that we've been applying to all sorts of types of things, whether it's a website, whether it's a physical process, or whether it's some sort of new service that people want to prototype. And this process we like to refer to it is just design thinking. And, you know, this talk is all about design thinking, but also the flexibility of how other organizations are going to be using it uh, to solve their problems and adapt to this changing time. For those who don't know what design thinking is, it's just a practical approach to finding solutions to problems that you don't have to be a designer to be, to do. And it's for us a mouthful, but we always just say that it's just a problem solving technique that we use. If you Google problem solving and, and design thinking, you'll get a lot of these diagrams. Um, you know, designers, we've designed this and we haven't really done a good job on describing it. And don't worry about Googling. The five generally accepted steps, which are stupidly simple to learn, are really just empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing. But we like to simplify it even more so people fully understand how easy it is. It's easy to understand, hard to kind of put in practice. It's doing research, identifying the insights for what came out of that research. And everybody's familiar with that. But then it's coming up with a lot of ideas based upon the few problems that you've kind of aligned on. And from there, trying them out and prototyping something quick and making sure that you don't take six months to, to, to reveal something and getting feedback really, really quickly. So then you go right back to those insights and, and update your prototypes. That's it. That's all we're going to talk about. And these are the steps that our clients and, and the people on our panel have been using. We've used it for all sorts of different practices, whether it's branding, whether it's product designs, website design, change management. It, it has a wide of application. And we like to encourage our clients and, and people to think the design thinking as kind of a set of ingredients, not necessarily a big recipe, but just a set of ingredients that you can use at your disposal whenever you think it's appropriate. 
And before we meet the panel, just want to talk about if you're interested in any sort of design thinking. Um, we are now practitioners with Zoo Academy. Today is the, the lunch and learn, but we also have a four hour fundamental course, but plus also more intensive workshops, the three to five day design thinking intensives. Um, you can go to Zoo Academy or zoo.com slash academy for more information for dates on any of those things coming up. Anyways, enough about me. I want to get us going and starting to talk to our panel. So what I'm going to do is sharing the screen and hopefully we are going to enable all the video of the other people, all the other panels. Panel members, are you there? Oh, there we go. Microphone check, check. Yeah. There we go. All right. Welcome. Everybody seems to be at home or at the office. Some good drywalling, I see. Okay. Let's just go around the horn and do a quick set of introductions. Um, quickly, why don't we start from my left to right? Bill, why don't you start and give us a little background on who Bill is? So, yeah, I'm Bill with Connexus, some uh, business design consultant here. I'm part of our dedicated design team. And, you know, for me, human centered design is something I fell into just with the passion for solving problems. and. I love, uh, you know, that side of my brain that can take the process and make something awesome, but uh, make sure I still stay human. So that's what's, uh, that's what I love about it. Human. That's the most human thing I've ever heard you say, Bill. <laughs> Trying for you, Al. All right, Kristen. Right. So I am the manager of the Idea Space team at FCC. My background's actually in marketing and spent the first nine years of my career at FCC on the brand and creative development team. So went from account management to strategy to managing the creative development team. Um, what really drew me into the idea space team is like the idea of taking the concept of design thinking, which you use in the creative world, and then really using that to solve complicated and complex problems and figuring out how to use that to build like different strategies and just really have that customer and human focus in it. So that's what drew me to this area. Awesome. And Mariev, all the way straight from Shikudemi. <laughs> you <done>. wish. <laughs> yeah, no, Quebecer in the prairies. I've uh, been on the FCC for 16 years. And before being the uh, idea space department, I was in the customer and digital experience team. So taking care of all the digital entities for customer facing. And what I love, I, I do similar stuff when I was in the web team, but like with the idea space, like it's being able to push the teams and really ask their tough questions and not having them hating you afterwards because that's your job now and you're like forcing them to think beyond their current biases really like it awesome and finally jg over there joel graham from connexus yes thank you i'm joel i'm with connexus uh, i'm the product manager of our member experience area uh, what I love about human-centered design, um, um, for me, it's it's just seemed always crazy to not to bring our members and our customers right to the uh, solution portion of whatever we're creating. Um, so it, it's just logical for me. Um, so yeah, excited to be here and, and chat this out. Awesome. Thank you, you guys very much. We have a whole slate of questions and discussions to have. Um, I'm just going to say if it, the audience has questions, uh, maybe just hold off just for the first bit, just because maybe we're going to answer them. And then once I get a further into it, maybe I'll ask you guys to form some questions and we have that Q&A thing down at the bottom and we will be able to monitor that and then we will ask the top questions. But before we go into the discussions, I just want to experiment by you doing a Zoom poll here and just quickly putting a poll in Zoom, which everybody, hopefully everybody online can answer. And the question right now I wanna know from everybody is like, has the pandemic increased the pressure for your organization to innovate or challenge conventional thinking? So we have agree or disagree. Basically wanna know, do you guys feel the pressure for innovation and you know different thinking in your organization? Okay, people frantically voting. This is good. Wow, it's a not a tight race, but it's kind of obvious. 
Joel was kind of convincing me that this is a leading question. So I was trying to edit it slightly. Okay, I'm just gonna end the poll and then I'm going to share the results. Looks like that 77 or 86% of the people agree that uh, the pandemic has increased the pressure on organizational innovation and co challenging conventional thinking while 14% feel that they've always been kind of progressively innovative and that's good. I'm glad that it wasn't, you know, 100% to nothing, which Joel thought it was going to be. <laughs> okay, so let's go around the horn and let's start talking. Joel and Chris, and I got a question for you guys. As the managers of your department, uh, give us an exam, uh, an idea of why your department exists. And Chris, and maybe start with the idea space. And, you know, it's such a unique sounding uh, department name, maybe give us an idea of like what the department is, like why was it created and really what your goal is. So I, when I joined the team last fall, it had already been up and running for about a year and a half. So I wasn't in at the ground floor when it was being built, but I did talk to Crystal, my director, because she was part of that. And she spoke about how, like we, we have an innovation lab at FCC and they were already using human-centered design, but they saw more opportunity to get more value from it if it, we were to lead with human-centered design as opposed to just kind of like interjecting at certain points in a, a process or a project. So the idea space team was created as kind of an offshoot to the innovation lab team with the lab focusing on emerging technologies or emerging innovation outside. Whereas the idea space was more about how do we bring innovation to the core business and how do we kind of scale up FCC's innovation practice. So that's how the idea space came to be. And we, we focus mostly on different things that are like corporate priorities or of higher priority at FCC. And those are the types of problems that we get involved in, types of areas, I guess. Oh, you're muted, Al. And Joel, how about your member experience uh, Novus group? Give us an idea of what that department's all about and just kind of an overview of it. Yeah, I think in the, in the big picture, Connexus realized banking's moving super quickly, changing very rapidly, and we need to be more intentional with preparing for the future. Um, it's specifically, it's, it's hard to be innovative when you're kind of just doing it off the side of your desk and you've got all of your operational tasks still going on. Uh, so we created Novus, or New Connexus, which is really specific teams that are a blend of human-centered design, agile methodologies and, and lean startup that are, are tasked with getting after what the future should look like. So our team in particular is the member experience team. Um, and, and really these teams are, like I said, intentional about innovation, remove operational distractions, we're, we're hived off a bit from the whole, really move at a rapid pace in kind of two week sprint cycles. Um, under the whole iterate, fail a little bit, learn, iterate again model and putting our members at the very core of, of every decision that we make. Um, that's really what our, our Novus teams and, and this area is all about. Awesome. So obviously we, we have two financial institutions, uh, albeit slightly different, but maybe give us an idea of the projects and problems you work on. Cause I want to show that, you know, what you guys are doing are very similar to what other big organizations are doing, whether regardless of what industry you guys are in. So Kristen, maybe kind of describe some of the project projects that your team's been able to work on. Um, I guess in our area, because we focus on some, some of those areas that are more corporate priorities, some of those would be internal facing, like, fixing processes or fixing things that impact employees, and then some go external to, to the FCC's customers. Um, some of the work we've done recently was supporting on the post-pandemic strategy. So what does that mean as far as getting employees back into the office? What are some things to consider in those decisions? And then how do we enable the customer experience with a move to more digital stuff too? So both you know internal and external facets, as well as like how do we how do we kind of capture that momentum and that velocity that we had during the pandemic and make that a more common practice or implement that going forward at FCC too, which Mary Ev and Al, you guys were both involved in that. How about you, Joel? Yeah, I think we've done a wide variety of things uh, since this group's been developed. So, you know, how might we uh, help people understand how to do their digital banking easier? through how to videos, you know, understanding member onboarding, how can we design a, a branch of the future? 
but really the the core thing that that we are really focused on is how can we make managing personal finances simpler and, and more human for people who might struggle financially sounds good Okay, so now we're going to talk to Bill and Mariev, who are more of the practitioners and holders of the knowledge when it comes to design thinking. Um, so Mariev, maybe give us a quick overview how the idea space kind of attacks a project when, you know, somebody comes in and has a problem from a different department. What are your major steps? Yeah, we typically always start with a partner intake interview. So we're asking them the tough question right from the start. It kind of ex know what to expect later on too. But we're going to ask them like, What's your problem you think you need to solve? How do you know this is the problem to solve? What research have you done before? Who have you talked to? Have you tried to solve this problem before? And why didn't it work? And then do you, are you willing to hear the tough things? Like not all customers will like your ideas and are you willing to accept that? And are you willing to do the tough work once you get the feedback from the customers and actually do the changes that are required? And at the end also like, do you have the authority to say yes or no to the changes that will come from this initiative? So once we have all that information, we meet as a team and then we brainstorm like, okay, well, what type of session could this look like? Who should we uh, involve? How long would that session be? Who do we need to talk to? How do we validate some of that information? Do we need to involve our market insights team and do some customer research? Do we need to do interviews? And we would figure out all these steps uh, before I actually start booking um, either interviews or even uh, considering booking customers for interviews and testing towards the end. And then yeah, just do the logistic of booking a workshop or a design sprint together. Okay, interesting. Bill, how different is that process from you? Because Mariev, the idea space is kind of like an internal consultancy, would you say, of, of FCC, where you guys are your facilitators and problem solvers and prototypers as well. But Bill, maybe kind of talk about your steps for, for the Novus team. I know that's great. I was frantically taking notes here to, to get that awesome uh, detail down on how to execute. Um, but yeah, no, ours would be very similar in that sense. So, you know, part of my time spent with our core design team, part of my times with, with MX here, and um, we approach it very similar. And I think for the MX team, it always has to start with that empathize piece. So it's like, you know, understanding what is going on, um, making sure we are looking at the right problem. Um, and then going from there and, and, you know, one thing that we always like to start with as well to get the team motivated around it is, it's coming up with that cool name because this has to be a fun process as well. Uh, so what's going to motivate us, motivate us through that. So, but yeah, definitely always starting with that empathize and, and making sure we understand where it is that we think we're going and, and set those, you know, steps along the way to, to level set back that we're still on the right track. Cause it's, it's very easy to go down those bunny trails and, um, fall off course. So that's kind of, uh, I think what I would add there. Awesome. So as you can see, everybody's talking about empathizing and, and, and understanding their users. Not all organizations are like that. Um, more often than not, we just get like a binder that says, here's our user data. And it's usually like a, you know, a spreadsheet or something, but rarely do they have some sort of like commitment to put customers at the center of their efforts. And Joel, how does Connexus manage to always put the, their users at the center of their designs and their, their planning? I think there's a, a few things that, that we try to do. Um, first, we recruit a really diverse team and always challenging people to put their member hat on. Um, so any, any problem that we're tackling, uh, we've got different viewpoints and people all trying to think from a member perspective. Um, Number two would be just being really clear with the problem that we're solving. And sometimes that involves developing a persona, uh, for example, of, of the person that we're solving this for. And again, like kind of like Bill said, trying to make it fun. So, so we, we bring in a fun name or something memorable about this persona. So for example, a lot of the problems we solve for are FOMO Jones or somebody like that. Um, number three for us is, is consistently just challenging ourselves. So not being afraid to play devil's advocate. Uh, and then, and then to me, by far the most important part is just not being afraid to go and speak to people. Um, we've done that a ton over the last year. Uh, we've met people in branches in coffee shops. We've taken them for interviews. We've brought them in for panel discussions. We've done 
just informal workshop brainstorming. Uh, and, and we developed a stakeholder group of our members and people in the community just to come in and, and direct our process. Whereas that used to be a lot of our executive. Now we take some of our cues really directly from, from our customers. And that's been, it's been a bit of a game changer for us. Awesome. Mary, I've, I'm going to try to ask the same question. I've, I've, the reason I kind of selected your organizations is as working with uh, clients, you guys seem to be on the forefront for bringing in customers. And Mariev, is it very similar with, at FCC, like the, the level of obsession you have putting users at the center of your design? Yeah, it's the same too. Like we would make sure if the impact's going to be customer facing to have them and have their voice and make sure that the people that will be impacted are the people that will be implementing that solution hear that voice too. So when they're like, three months on the road coding, we still can hear that feedback and it's still like line of sight to what they need to do. And also like I would add probably that like as a facilitator, you are that representative, you are the ambassador for the customer. So you have to keep on bring that voice back at the center of the, the discussion. So if like you're two or three steps later after the interviews, like making sure that you bring that, I don't forget, Joe customer told us this and like to bring it back and understanding too that all of this process is reiteration so we should always go back to our customers and users to see hey do, are we still on the right road and not being a just oh yes we've tested this is all good we can we're good to go for the next two years to always revalidate reval with the customers yeah and that goes back to the whole mantra of uh designing with the customer and not for them always checking in and taking the temperature uh kristen this next question is about for you guys um i was we were talking earlier about internal projects and obviously bill and joel they seem to work on a lot of like member experience things so customer facing things but fcc with idea space i know you guys work on a lot of internal projects and we've had some questions uh, early from uh, the public wondering how do you work how do you centralize this sort of process when you're working on an internal project and how do you identify users internally i think it, it all depends what it is that you're working on right so ultimately like the employees would be the users of whatever you're working on so which which employees would be that target user group? And then how do you work with them to help design it for them? We had um, Levi on our team had worked on a change management tool at one point for field staff. So when they had their, their Google design sprint, they had people from the field staff who were in that session and giving that really direct feedback on what works for them, what the pain points were and how to move forward. And so even after that sprint, as they took that piece away and kept iterating on it, they kept going back to those users again and again. So it's very like, to me, it feels very similar to anything that's customer facing. It's just the user is different. So you're working with a different group. Awesome. Um, Bill, let's talk about methods, activities, and exercises when you're facilitating a specific, you know, workshop or trying to solve a problem. What are some of those uh, kind of brainstorming workshops or what are these activities and, and, and exercises that you see yourself always going back to? Yeah, there's so many out there to, to choose from and so many great resources as well. And for me, it's it's just right sizing it to the to the problem, to the workshop, to the group of individuals there, you know, things that come to mind. Um, you know, I love crazy Yates when it comes to doing, you know, those creative touch and feel designy pieces. I love lightning talks, uh, especially for myself, you know, when you're bringing in that expert and you're trying to learn from them, uh, but they tend to ramble on too long. And, empathy map personas, prioritization matrixes, there's so many options out there. And it's just realizing that design sort of has that flow. So you're trying to expand things and, and then bring it back in and then expand again as you go. So it's just, you know, testing out, see what's working for each of those different situations and, and always making sure that you've got that connection back to, to the member and to those pieces that you've been learning along the way. Um, and again, like Zoo Academy, a little plug for you guys there, right? You've you've got all those great skills out there, but there's also other great free ones out there with the Google design kit and IDEO.org. You can go and just play through and, and test them out. Bill, there are no other resources other than Zoom <laughs> Academy. What did we talk about earlier? <laughs> um, well, I, sorry, it's really distracting that I have the my Venetian blind sunlight going on my face, but I hope you guys realize it kind of lines up 
with the Venetian blinds that are behind my fake <laughs> virtual wallpaper. So, um, Maria, to talk, talking to all the other people who facilitate and run their own workshops, what are the go-to exercises that you think that they should all be doing? Oh, use a lot of dot, vo dot voting. Um, like it just brings it brings everyone to the same level. You democratize those decisions and you get alignment right from the beginning. Um, personas, again, we talked about this already, but it's super important to have a kind of a visualization of who you're doing this for. And it brings, again, everyone aligned. I know who I do this for. Um, Hopes and fear, like I, I go back to that one all the time because after sometimes it's challenging those you like you and I tackled a pretty hard, difficult workshop and subjects and at the end of the day, we're like, like, what are you hopeful for and what do you fear? But like exactly what do you fear? So everything's off the table and you understand where you stand after this. So your recommendation and compensate all of that at the same time too. In terms of like activities we've been doing lately, like doing uh, what would have to be true is the awesome one. It kind of delivers what would be your barriers of the solution, but with a positive spin, which is important. You don't want people to be naysayers the entire time. Mm -hmm. So what would have to be true and the hopes and fears. I really enjoyed doing hopes and fear. Hopes and fears is such an easy one that you can just do at the very beginning of a, a workshop for sure. I'm going to combine this next question uh, to talk about success stories and how to like build momentum. So Bill, um, how do you, you know, a lot of people just say, oh, design thinking is cool. We tried it and it was this fun little workshop. And then it kind of stopped right after that. They weren't able to carry over that idea into something that made it to live. And all of us have worked on a project that it was a cool project, but you know, it didn't see the light of day maybe give a success story and maybe how did you actually take something that was kind of in the lab and it make it to the final, uh, into the, into the wild? Well, there's a lot, uh, a lot to unpack there, but, you know, I think it all starts with understanding the organization and, and the, the structure and the flow of, you know, how does work actually get done and connecting those dots to your workshop and how you work through it. Um, you know, we've got a situation where, you know, a great example the team shared, they were working with the group and what happened was they had this situation where like, here's a problem, we know the solution, let's execute the solution. And, you know, we're thinking, you know, maybe we should just confirm before we go too far. And we went to the point where we went to execute um, and shared it with the users and got that nasty gut check where it's like, this is gonna work for us, this isn't, this isn't right. Um, so the team went back and like, yeah, maybe we, maybe you're right. Maybe we should try that. And, and we went through the, the process. Um, and I think the cool thing out of that is those individuals that were part of that process are now the champions for us moving forward. Right. So when you're hitting those roadblocks, those other individuals are like, no, give it, give it a chance. Cause you don't want to waste that time. Like we did um, and come to that point where you have that awkward conversation where it's like, you got this solution you love. Um, but you forgot to kind of fall in love with the problem at first and make sure you're actually solving something of value. So I think that's like a, a relatively recent example that just really shows the value you can create when you go through it. Right on. Kristen, I'm going to throw that to you. Give us a, an example of a success story that you're able to kind of take from, you know, workshop all the way to seeing something that's out in the wild. Um. I would say the example I mentioned earlier, like that change management communication tool was one where, you know, when they first tested that prototype in the sprint, it wasn't all glowing feedback, but they took it and they kept iterating on it and making improvements and moving it forward. So it ended up being a really successful tool. One of the challenges that I think everyone kind of has when how do you how do you time that workshop in a way that it flows with when your resources are available to you? And so I can see Mary, I was kind of starting to smile a little bit there because that's something that we're working through right now too but we're trying to capture like okay so when when do we have capacity to move on something and so then how do we time when something comes through the idea space so that it can move from ideation to implementation without a bit of a, a lag in between where you lose some of that momentum so it's it's possible and we're working on making it more streamlined always right but yeah mm -hmm. definitely a challenge Awesome. We're going to go talk about the remote uh, working in a second, but I want to do one last audience poll. And this question is talking about your delivery of your products and services as an organization. So when it comes to delivering your products or services, internal or external, which of the following statements is true? 
that you have a clear understanding of your users and their needs, but aren't executing on it. You have a clear understanding of your users and, and their needs and are executing on it. So you feel like you have a pretty good handle on human centered design and pushing it out, or you just don't have a clear understanding of your users or their needs. So we'll just watch this. This is exciting to be able to kind of watch this poll and live. So yeah, just a reminder, if you guys have some questions and maybe now is the time to put it in the Q&A, we have a few people at Zoo kind of filtering through some of the questions that uh, will kind of surface up to me. And then if we have time, we will start asking some. Okay, I'm just gonna, oh, people are subtracting their votes and I'm just gonna end the poll now and then people can see that we have 28% of people feel like they have a good understanding of their users, but aren't really executing on it. And 36% feel like they have a clear understanding of their users and, and are executing on it. So that's really good to see. And, you know, 35% believe that they don't have a clear understanding of their users or their needs. So um, take that information as you will, but it's, it's always fun to do a poll, right guys? Gives me a break. <laughs> okay. So now, Let's talk about remote work. And obviously this is again, everybody calls it the new normal. Um, I see that some of you guys are back to work and some of you guys are still at home very much like we are half time. Um, but our, our work relies on being typically in a room whereas we thought you needed to be in a room to run all these workshops. But uh, surprisingly, we've been able to be pretty effective. Um, Bill, maybe let's start with you. Let's talk about how's it going and what sort of things are really working for you guys. We're working remotely doing such sort of like heavy team involvement. Yeah, you know, I was going to like start talking with my microphone on mute here just to show what always seems to happen in these workshops, but <laughs> there's nothing like face to face. Um, I think a thing that works for us, like you said, you know, some of us are in the office, some of us are at home, but you know, if, if one person's remote, you got to have that mindset that everybody's remote um, and then have the right tools to support you. Uh, and with those tools, you have to take the time in advance of, of your workshops to um, run your participants through because the last thing you want to do is you're kicking off your session, you've got a finite amount of time um, and people can't figure out how to put that sticky note in there or delete something or, or whatever else. And I think if we go through that and, and you take the time to set up your virtual boards in the right way, it goes a long way to making that session more valuable and keeping things bite sized, incorporating breaks and fun things just to, you know, give people that chance to feel like they're not just, you know, staring at that screen for hours on end because it can can be pretty tough. So it's finding, finding that balance. Awesome. Kristen, how about you? What's, what's working remotely and give us an idea what, how you guys make it work. It's working remotely is going really well right now. I, I think it's funny, like Albert, I was thinking about this this morning. We all started working from home one week in March and the following week, you and I moved a two day in-person workshop to a six hour remote workshop and it, it worked. We've evolved a lot since then though. Um, we would no longer do a six hour remote workshop, but what we find to be kind of that magic number is three, like anything over three, people start to lose a bit of engagement. So if you can keep it, cap it at three hours, that's ideal for us. And another thing is that we, um, we don't shy away from pre-work or homework anymore, right? So if, if participants know that by putting in some effort prior to going to the session, it's gonna shorten the amount of time that they're in that remote session, they're all game for it too. Uh, one of the, the tools we use that's been, I would say like a game changer for us is a collaboration software or site called Mural. And I know there are other programs like that, like Miro or Miro, however you say it, but we had Mural set up on our team before the pandemic and it was just a game changer. We were able to switch from in-person to remote within a week because we had that functionality available. I think, Al, you were going to pull this up on your screen, right? You bet. I'm just going to demo what Kristen was talking about. If you guys aren't familiar with Mural, there are a lot of different kind of whiteboarding softwares. So this is just an example of a canvas that you can zoom in. And we have other people, as you can see, working on it at the same time. So we have an ability to zoom in and fill out this canvas, for example, like this is the problem statement who the stakeholders are, what's the big idea. And you can quickly just keep adding post-it notes. Uh, you can add images, you can add icons to do anything. And we just kind of drew how this thing works. And so everybody has a shared understanding and can like put 
you know, thumbs up to it or put questions as as possible or, and it, it's, if you think about this as a whiteboard compared to um, what you do in person, you can't just animate, like a lot of people can't draw a plane or a person sleeping very clearly, but you can easily drop these things in so people can clearly see what's going on. So yeah, exactly. The internet's so helpful and it's very, very fast. But one thing we always like to do is, is to do, you know, voting. And so this thing, if I summon everybody to, to follow me, everybody can follow me and we can look at one screen and I say, what can we prototype and test? And I'll run a quick vote just to show everybody. I'll say, start voting session. And I'll give everybody like three dots and they have to vote in this prototype area, what we should be voting. So we'll go next and I'll say, begin voting. And in here, it'll show all the different people who is voting and you can keep track. So you just imagine in COVID, non-COVID times, you'd be kind of huddled around a whiteboard and everybody be trying to read close to what these post-it notes say, but we just can't do that anymore. So um, it's important to know that you can do this voting session and who's visiting Rabbit, who's not voting. Oh, but then once you're done voting, you typically can see voting results. We just have two people who haven't voted. Oh, I guess I'm one person. So <laughs> we have three, two other people. Anyways, typically you can see who won the vote and then you can take that idea and move it forward. So this is just a quick look. This wasn't supposed to be a mural demo, but I just wanted to kind of just share a tool that we use on the daily. And these canvases can be three, four times as big as what we just saw. Okay, I'm going to end this with one last question. Maybe Joel and, and Kristen, you can kind of talk about just the challenges of this progressive thinking and design thinking. Um, selling this up the ladder, the question we get a lot of times is like, okay, we all get it, but it's not us you have to influence. It's our executive. It's our leadership. Um, Kristen or Joel, how do you kind of sell this up the ladder and like with, with usually culture being the biggest challenge? How are you able to kind of like get everybody on board with this? I'll go, Joel. Sure, I can kick it off. Um, I think similar to everything design thinking, it's important to understand why that person is feeling that way. Um, is it too fluffy? Is it too hard to bring members into the equation? But really understand why they're feeling that way. And then design small experiences, small commitments that let them see the, the value early, but doesn't seem so massive and big and scary. Um, and then the only other piece that, that we try to think about is bring them along the journey. Um, I, if I reflect back on all of our failures throughout this last year, uh, one of the big ones, you can almost directly tie back into when there was a culture clash or it didn't work, it's that we, we didn't think enough down the line who needs to be involved and how we can bring them in really, really early um, in, in, a, in a small fashion that they're going to see some value right away. And Kristen, how about you? Yeah, very similar. And I mean, coaching that Crystal had given too about, you know, having that innovation practice in a company is just start small and expand, like do experiments, find out what are those successful components of the experiment, and then repeat and expand and keep doing that. I think it's important for people to realize too, that you're not going to completely transform overnight. You can't, you can't do that. You can't transform an, an entire organization that quickly. But as long as you're moving that dial a little bit every day, like it, when you get further ahead and you look back, you'll see just how much progress you've made too. Awesome. I'm going to start taking some questions from the audience. And one right now, we have one. It's very rela related to what you guys were just talking about. It's like getting buy-in from your finance leadership on user-based design thinking programs and the activities. Because uh, both of your um, departments have had a big commitment based upon you know, the fact that you've spun up these departments and a lot of people are doing this sort of thing on the side of their desk. How do you, like, what would you talk to and tell somebody from the finance leadership department about investing in this and committing to something like this? Who wants to take this? I think, I think it is kind of a continuation of what we're saying, right? Like if you can, if you can start small, it's less of, a, less of an investment upfront and it's not nearly as scary. Right? So that's a good way to get buy-in is to start with those smaller bite-sized pieces. And then as you are experiencing success, make sure you're sharing that too. Like people want to invest in things that they find valuable to them or that they, they see getting traction or making progress. So it will make that easier down the road too. And Anybody else, Bill? Add, Al, you know, it's, there's a lot of costs when you don't do it. And when, like, when you work through things and you do it the wrong way, 
um, leveraging this as a process, you can identify those sooner and iterate or fail forward or, you know, however you want to call it. Um, you know, there's so many great examples out there where you, they launch something and there's a hidden cost to having a poor user experience. Um, so I think if you can help find those out and, and how you're telling the story, it helps as well. Awesome. Uh, we have another question talking about uh, apps in the wild or websites in the wild. Like what's your favorite tool for understanding or monitoring the user experience? Like what sort of sp specific tools are you guys using just to kind of collect data from people using live uh, tools or live websites or apps? One thing that we've just recently kind of put into play is, is Hotjar. And it's been awesome for, for our web web app, you can kind of watch how the user is moving about the screen. Um, rather than just asking questions around how their what their experience is like, you actually get to watch it in real time. Um, it's been very useful for us. It's that hot jar, just so people know. Google, lots of things to Google. Um, we have uh, one that says, I work on stakeholder engagement. How do you apply the design thinking approach to something that is less of a problem than a check in? Oh, somebody just deleted it. <laughs> So it's in Slack, supposedly. <laughs> so somebody dismissed it. That, that's our IT department, Shane. He's, he's deleting them as I'm reading them. <laughs> so somebody was asking a question about less, uh, it's less a problem, but just more of a check-in with the community. How do you use that? Um, oh, it, Chelsea saved me and she said, how would you apply design thinking approach to something that is less of a problem than a check-in or program review, particularly in a government heavy bureaucratic context? And you know, working with a lot of people from government, the public engagement thing is really big and you see the city, the civic service is doing that quite a bit. How do you apply this the whole design thinking process into something like that? If nobody wants to answer this, oh, Kristen, there and Bill, there you go. I was just gonna say, gonna that's a great question. <laughs> Okay. Mary Ev, do you have a response? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think like our role too is to create psychological safety, right? So using human centered design or design thinking is like making sure that whoever you have involved feels safe to have those tough check-in conversation. So you're creating that environment, but following the same steps like that Al was showing us, like em empathizing. So ask them what's going on, uh, getting deep into the problems and making sure the room is open to listening. And then giving them a chance to put all of their issues at the table and then helping them refocusing. That's all part of the process. I, I would also say head. that, you know, it not necessarily has to be a problem, but once you do engagement, the whole problem is to identify problems. And it's not necessarily huge problems, but it could be identifying challenges and pain points and in trying to improve a system that your competitors aren't going to improve because they haven't done the research. But Joel, you're going to say something. I, I was just going to say from some of our experiences, um, People want to give their opinion and they feel really valued when you ask them, um, but make it a fun event that people are excited to come and partake in and there's going to be some additional value for them. So we've done, you know, like dark and stormy brainstorm sessions with the community where we serve them a dark and stormy in the evening and we, we kind of bat around crazy ideas or, you know, just put some excitement around whatever you're doing and, and often people are excited to come and give their, their thoughts. Awesome. I have maybe two more questions. One, this one's a little bit more complicated is like about corporate lean initiatives and user design thinking. Uh, we hear that a, a decent amount that, you know, we're doing some lean uh, processes. Do they compete with each other? Which come first? Should one initiate process occur over initiative or process occur, occur over the other? I get excited about this one. I don't know if I've got the answer, but um, I honestly, I feel like they can complement each other really well. Some of my background is what I would like to refer to as like lean for service. So you're looking at the more of the service industry. So maybe slightly less technical, but you know, I think um, lean has, you know, the concept of going to the Gemba. So you're talking to the user. How different is that from human centered design, right? So I think where the crossroads come back is when you're working through the human centered design process, you got to have those checks, you know, is this viable? Is this feasible? Um, you know, 
human-centered design always, you know, you're checking off that desirable piece, but sometimes you got to get into the less, you know, arts and craftsy piece and, and, you know, satisfy the finance side of the company and say, you know, does this actually make sense? Can we do this? And where's the balance there? Right. Okay. That's a, that's a great answer. And I know that uh, FCC has the Agile Dojo. It's an Agile Center of Excellence that teaches Agile, but they also have right next to them the Design Thinking Department of Idea Space. So it's not just, uh, you know, Agile or Design Thinking versus Lean, but it could be just a, a mix, mix mash of different uh, um, methodologies that have to come together. And we've suggested that the Agile and design thinkers get together and start talking about similarities between their processes to kind of create a uniformed language. So it's not, most organizations have different problem solving mechanisms or initiative and process uh, systems. So we always like making sure that everybody sees the commonality, that everybody wants to solve the same thing and move quick. So maybe one more question, uh, or maybe two more. One, this is a, a good problem to solve before we close it up is, I'm a part of a team working on an onboarding package for new customers. How do you avoid over explaining parts of your offering and possibly scaring away those new customers? Like what would you, if say this was uh, plopped on our, our desk, how would you go about doing that? So Kristen. Mary, Eva, I was gonna talk, but I saw you nodding at the same time. So I'll, I'll start and then lead into you maybe, but I would say like, talk to those customers, talk to customers and see what information is relevant or important to them and start using that to determine what it is that you need to communicate to them too. They like don't assume that what you think is important to a customer is what's actually important to them. And that's, in my mind, that's a good starting point. And probably making personas for different types of users who are, you know, the ones who need the over explaining and, and an understanding like how much they occupy of your majority. Interesting. Just the last question, because I know it's already one o'clock. Somebody was asking about uh, trying to meet people. Uh, how do you connect with partners that are of like minds in the tech industry? Um, I know there's a bunch of different meetups. It depends what city you're in, but with this remote thing, um, it's tricky. Sometimes you have to go to design talks. Sometimes you have to go to like the YXC data group that you can get a lot of like data and analytical stuff there. But how would you guys meet up with, you know, in Regina, all four of you guys in Regina, how do you guys meet up with like-minded people in the tech industry? Like, where do you guys go? I think it's maybe a bit harder in, in the pandemic, but um, just, just talking about what you have going on and before you know it and, and, you know, sharing your network and before you know it, you're going to be bumping into people that are doing a very similar process that you're doing. Um, I was going to plug, just been recently playing around with, LinkedIn learning, it's, it's got so many really cool tools that then can kind of draw you into different communities um, pretty, pretty quickly and easily and, and make some unique connections that way. Um, so that's, that's been a recent one for me that's been pretty cool. Kristen or Maria, maybe from FCC, like, or do you guys just shut off your computer and just look after the kids? Well, there's some of that that happens sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, like, um, I personally have kept like the Slack channel open from the Google Sprint conference and we'll go and ask them questions regularly. So just understand like, have you guys seen this? Have you used uh, this methodology for this purpose? And just getting outside voices to uh, the problems we might be facing. Awesome. Yeah, I was, well, I was it is say the same thing, Maria. Sorry, awesome. It, it is after three after one. And I, you know, one thing that we always pride ourselves as being on time. And I know that uh, everybody still has work to do. So I want to just thank everybody for coming out today. I want to thank our panels from SEC and uh, Connexus and just welcome, um, just say thanks a lot for joining. And uh, we are going to be doing more of these lunch and learns. And so just subscribe. I don't know if that we have something you can subscribe to, but just maybe go to zoo.com slash academy for more information. And you'll be able to get more information on the fundamentals course that we're putting on that's coming up right away in November 10th. And then a more intensive three to five day uh, training package. And for those of people who are in Saskatchewan, make sure to to look up the reopen Saskatchewan training grants because if you if you get approved 
the training budget is totally taken care of and you get your money refunded back to you. So it basically covers the cost. So that's the reopen Saskatchewan training grant. And yeah, if you like what you heard here and are more interested in learning about it, please look into zoo Academy or zoo.com. Anyways, want to just say thank you very much for joining and have a good afternoon, everybody.